Hi, this is Robert Rodriguez, author of Solo in the 70s and Revolver, How the Beatles Reimagined Rock and Roll. And you are listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. And good day or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly show talking about the latest news happenings and people making news in the Beatle world. I'm Steve Marinucci, the author author of uh, Beatles Examiner and several other music columns on examiner.com, and I'm joined by my co-host and longtime broadcasting veteran who brings you the weekly Beatles Every Little Thing show that's heard live on WNHU and in syndication, uh, the amazing Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. The amazing Mr. Ken Michael. <laughs> That's the longest introduction we've ever had on this show. I well, know. Well, well, you well, know, what can I say? Th- thanks for the flattering words, Steve. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. And this week we welcome and we we have another disc jockey in the house, uh, a longtime radio veteran who saw Beatlemania and Stones Mania and Monkey Mania from the radio side, the legendary Mr. Dave Hall, who's written a an autobiography, Hullabaloo, The Life and Misadventures of a Radio le- Legend, Dave Hell. Welcome, yeah. Dave. Oh, thank you very much to both of you. That's very nice of you. And I know we're going to have fun today. I, I, I think we are. Let me, let me start by asking a very basic question. How, how long have you been in the radio business? Okay, are you both sitting down? <laughs> I'm sitting. I'm sitting. Okay, we know Steve is, but are you sitting down, Ken? Yes, I am. Uh, I worked on the air for 56 years. Woo! Yeah, I know. It's quite a while, and uh, 35 of those in L.A. I was very fortunate along the line. A lot of people work uh, two to four years and or maybe ten and figure that's a long life in radio. I was very fortunate in staying on the air as long as I was. And you did a lot of uh, in your your non before you got to L.A. Or I shouldn't say before you got to L.A. Outside of being a disc jockey in L.A., you did a lot of other things. And, and you mentioned in your book, example, for example, that you actually hosted the pilot of a game show. Yes, I did, but that was after I was in L.A. Okay, um, it, it was um, uh, quick as a wink, and mm-hmm. it never got off. The it never got on the air. We shot the pilot. And it's mentioned in the book with pictures and everything, Steve, but we never really got it on the air on NBC. Mm -hmm. I I missed a chance with Dick Clark to do Shebang, and that went to Casey Kasem when I turned it down to go with Quick as a Wink. And you know what happened to to Casey, (laughs) and uh, our show never got on the air for NBC. Mm. Wow. We're going to talk about your history. I mean, obviously, we have to talk about KRLA because that's where yeah. your, your association with the Beatles lies. But just from a radio perspective, I know that for most people, when they hear the names Bob Eubanks, they think of the Newlywed Game. When they hear Casey Kasem, it's American Top 40. Most of the country knows those two guys for those shows. And they are just looked upon as being icons you know, for the, for those programs, but you work with them at KRLA in those days. What were they like as disc jockeys? How different were they from the personas that they, that they had after that? Well, Casey was very near what uh, he did in his later years on American Top 40. I mean, I remember Casey when he would bring in, he came down from San Francisco in a beat-up old Plymouth, and it took, we had to go out and push it to start it, and now he's in a home that's worth 40 or $50 million in Bel Air, and so he's changed from that standpoint. Mm. But I remember him on the air in 1964 where he had a Rolodex, and he would flip through the Rolodex until he found something to say about a particular artist. Basically, he took that concept and with others, and made it into a hit worldwide show, American Top 40. As far as Bob Eubanks is concerned, he's really changed a lot. The man had one thing going for him, guys, that that started him off. In a business sense, there was nobody on the air 
in L.A. or New York that I know of who was successful in business as Bob Eubanks. This man had two or three cinnamon cinders. They were um, teen rock clubs that, you know, you could only get root beer or Pepsi or Coke. You couldn't buy a hard liquor drink within, I think, 100 feet of the place. But that's how he started. And uh, he's been remarkable as far as his career in television. I don't have to tell you that. You guys know. You also worked with, um, there were a couple of other guys at Carol A that everybody that um, everybody will recognize. One was Charlie O'Donnell, correct? Oh, yes. Charlie, uh, God rest his soul. Um, he was a, a fellow who took Bob Hudson, Emperor Hudson's place, and uh, came out with Dick Clark. What a tremendous man and a tremendous talent. We lost a great deal when we lost Charlie. He was the nicest man I think my wife and I knew, he and his wife, really nice people. Hmm. I mean, everybody knows Charlie O'Donnell because he he did all those introductions um, on uh, on television. Uh, you always heard his name. Just for the record, who else was at Carol A. besides Charlie and you and, and well, Casey? Well, Dick Biondi. You know, Dick B- people, ah, yeah, there mm-hmm. we go. Yes, and and people forget that Dick was out on the West Coast because he's become so synonymous before he got out on the West Coast with Chicago and WLS. Mm-hmm. But, and he's back there on FM and has been since he left. But this man was remarkable because I've never heard anyone whose uh, voice was so erratic that could make it as big as, as Dick Biondi did. People loved that guy. Of course, I don't know if he still uses the, the moniker, the wild-eyed Trallion or not. I think he does. But out here in the 60s, people were shocked that somebody could scream as loud and hard as he did. But he was a name that is synonymous with the first part of KRLA. And also, as many Beatle fans are aware, when he was on WLS, he was the first disc jockey in America, supposedly anyway, to play the Beatles. Yes, he was. And before I even, even, you know, uh, agreed to become their uh, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, the whole, uh, you know, whole different kinds of jobs that I took on myself, sergeant at arms. I took a bevy of things on, but he was the first one who played an actual song on the air and, and while he was in Chicago. And uh, he brought a great deal of, uh, of uh, a focus to them when he came out here to work on the West Coast. Not to uh, get too technical, but there is a... Everybody seems to think that the first Beatle record was played in Washington, not in Chicago. Let's, I don't know if we need to. Uh, you know who I'm talking about, uh, uh, Ken? Uh, well, I Dick Biondi. Carol, is it Carol Williams? No, Carol James. Carol James, I'm in sorry. In Washington, and Dick Biondi played Please Please Me first. Okay, so he, he play, Biondi played it before James did. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think he did, and to the tune of um, I Could Ask uh, Ken because he seems to know more about this than, than you or I, Steve. But wasn't he several months ahead of the rest in, in playing Please Please Me? Well, he had to be, because Please Please Me was released early in 63 here. I don't remember yeah, the exact month, but it was in the first half of 63. Yeah. I mean, as Bruce Spicer has pointed out in his books, there were little pockets around the country that played Beatles just a little bit of airplay, but um, Dick Biani is supposed to be the first one to play the Beatles. He talked about She Loves You being played in Massachusetts. Um, California, there were supposed to be some areas in California that were playing the Beatles in 63 as well. I know in, when I lived in, in the Boston area, we were hearing, we were hearing uh, Beatles for Sale, before, you know, the songs off of Beatles for Sale before they came out over here. Boston, Boston was really good about doing that. Before we talk about KRLA, First of all, I want to just go back to this very amusing story about the first time you had a radio show, which was in the Armed Forces Radio, and you were doing a classical show. Why don't you tell everyone how that went? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I, I, I wanted to always be on the air. That was my big focus when I was a youngster. 
so when I was sent overseas with the uh, with the Air Force, I walked into Armed Forces Radio, and I said, how do you go on the air here? And as it says in the book, Hullabaloo, the man, there was a staff sergeant at the front desk, and nobody wanted to touch that show. It was a classical show from 6 to 6.15 p.m., and it went all over North Africa, and especially in Morocco, Casablanca, and, and uh, Sidi Slamane, and Rabat. And it was very popular, except for the young men. All of the officers, many of the officers, liked the classical music. And the general on the base, uh, General Jackson, he loved the show. So nobody wanted to touch it. Well, the man said to me, the staff sergeant, hey, how'd you like to go on the air at 6 tonight? I said, I've never been on the air in my life. He says, oh, don't worry about a thing. You take this script, go back to your barracks. Look it over, because all the music is already programmed, and it tells you what to read. And you'll just read it off, and you'll do fine. I said, okay, you can, I mean, I'm going to be on the air at 6 p.m. This was about, I don't know, 1 or one thirty in the afternoon, so I took the script out of his hand. My heart started pounding. I rushed back to my barracks, the hut that I lived in, and I looked at the script. And everything was written in German. <laughs> every aria, every name, it was written in German. There were long lines of German text. I had never spoken German in my life. <laughs> and, and I did speak fluent Spanish, but there was, there's nothing, <laughs> in, if you could imagine, any words that are like English or a Spanish in the German language. Well, I had two choices uh, then, Ken. I, I could either return the script and give up my life's ambition or go on the air and fake it. What do you think I did, Ken? You faked it. Yes, of <laughs> course. You, do, you would do the same thing. So would Steve. If you were thrown into this thing, you'd go back to the radio station and pretend fully on that you knew exactly what you were talking about. Well, I did. And I started using, instead of using German, I didn't know how to pronounce it, I'd say Der Formengarfer of, of the Sonata Oemden Morformenen. And I was making words up. And the people were laughing from one end of Morocco to the other. Now, the general, General Jackson, who was a one-star general who loved the show, had a two-star general from Europe in, an army two-star, a major general. And he thought he was listening to the program with, with General Jackson, the man who loved it, and he started roaring in laughter. He said, this man doesn't have a clue. <laughs> and the phone started lighting up, Ken. And I mean, all over North Africa, people were calling in saying, where did you get this guy? He doesn't have a clue. Well, the phones rang and rang and rang. There was a corporal answering the phones. We had about eight phone lines coming in, and that was a lot back in, in, uh, uh, in 1955. Uh, uh, so he came rushing into the control room and said, What the hell are you doing in here? And I said, I'm making all this stuff up. He said, Well, I don't care what you're doing. Do more of it because the phones have never rung like this before. <laughs> so I did. And uh, to tell you the truth, the general called me the next day and talked to Lieutenant Andy Gary, who was our station manager. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Gary, as you read in the book, jumped to attention when he told him he was Brigadier General Jackson calling for Airman Dave Hull. Well, they sent a car to my barracks because he wanted to see me in the office. Well, all the guys at the radio station, Armed Forces Radio, they figured he's finished. They'll send him to Sir, uh, Siberia. They'll find a place for this guy, but he's finished because nobody does this to any of our Armed Forces Radio programs. Well, a tech sergeant with five stripes came roaring up in a staff car, and he told me, he said, General Jackson wants to see you in his office. 
And I, I, here goes a corporal. I only had two stripes. I was an airman second class by then. I had two stripes on my sleeve. And I'm going to go see a man with one star on his lapel? Well, <laughs> the guy who was a tech sergeant, he had five stripes. He was very unhappy. They, they had to open the door for a corporal, believe me. <laughs> but he rushed me off to General Jackson's office. And there I was told uh, the staff sergeant who was his uh, one of his aides said, when you go in, you have to report as ordered. And I said, I understand. He said, he'll be just a second. He's on the phone. And about that time, he told the general that Airman Hull was present. And he said, oh, send him in. He said, he wants to see you now. He said, wait till he gets off the phone and then come to attention, salute, and report as ordered. I said, thanks a lot, Sarge. So I went through the door stood at attention until he got off the phone. I came to attention, came to a smart salute, and said, um, General Jackson, Airman Ho, reporting as ordered. And he said something that had never been said to me by an officer until that time. They always say, at ease, Airman, or as you were, Airman. Mm -hmm. This guy said, have a seat, Airman Ho, and there was a couch. So, man, my day was really moving forward. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a great story. Um, that's, that's what launched your radio career right there. <laughs> it did because General Jackson told me in that meeting, he said, uh, Airman Ho, you have started something going on that we haven't seen in North Africa, and I'm getting calls, the radio station is getting calls, your commanding officer is getting calls. He was a major from all over Morocco saying this is the funniest thing they've ever heard. <laughs> let's let's um let me let me ask about the the Beatles and when when you were at KLR, KRLA, when did you guys first hear that there was something coming from Britain called the Beatles? Well, I heard the Beatles twist and shout, I think, in nineteen sixty three when I was in Columbus, Ohio. And we had a meeting with the disc jockeys, and we all voted on whether it should be added to our playlist. And I said, no. I said, I don't think they're that good. Now, I'm, I'm telling you some things that are going to upset a lot of Beatle fans and Beatle maniacs. But uh, I, did, I did say that when I first heard it. It wasn't until I got in 1964 maybe 63, late 63, I'd had a show on the air from 9 to midnight that they gave me when Dick Biondi left and went back to Chicago. And they gave me his hours, 9 to midnight. And I had a thing called homework hotline. I would, people would call teenagers doing their homework and would tell me a, a particular problem they were having with and then I would urge uh, college students at Caltech and SC and UCLA to think about the question and give us the answer. Well, that was very successful. It really was. Kids were getting A-pluses on their papers. Their teachers were saying, I don't know what he's doing, but everybody at one school was urged by their mathematics teacher that they were to listen to the Dave Hull Show on KRLA. But it wasn't until Dick Moreland, he's deceased now too, what a great guy. He was our assistant program director at KRLA. And he said to me one night, we decided you're going to be the president of the Beatles fan club. I said, oh, what the devil does that mean? And, and I said, if I'm going to be the president, I'm going to become the vice president, secretary, treasurer, and the sergeant at arms. He said, we don't care what you do. Just go do it. So they gave me a, a bunch of songs that they wanted me to play. I want to hold your hand, can't buy me love. I feel fine. There was a whole batch of them, twist and shout. And they said, just use these tonight and see what, and just have fun with it. That's how it really started with me. But you said, but you said you had heard twist and shout before that. Approximately when did you hear twist yes. and shout? Yes. What, what month, what month was, was that? 
I can't remember the time because I went to Tampa at WFLA after Columbus before I got to to L.A. Okay. Um, I, I'm really not too sure of the time, but I listened to it, and we didn't like it. Johnny Dollar was one of our big jocks at, at uh, the station in Columbus, and he voted no on it, too. He okay. said, no, they have nothing to offer. And we saw their pictures with their scraggly hair, and we said, I don't think they have anything to offer. That was in late 63. So it really wasn't, did I hear the rest of the songs by the Beatles and, and, and was told that you're going to do it. And I had related the story to Dick Moreland, saying we didn't like these guys when I was in Columbus hmm. and Ohio. And he said, well, you're going to be the big guy now. And that's how that started. Well, immediately I learned all there was to know about the Beatles and their girlfriends and wives and so forth. Okay. You talk about um, how you got a scoop that John and George and also Cynthia and Patty would be arriving at LAX airport. And well, you, you, you interviewed I, them on the plane. Yes. Uh, that was really the major part of my career in the, on the West Coast. No one out here had heard their voices. They had seen them on um, television performing, but nobody had interviewed them, let me put it that way. And I had a phone call after I had taken over becoming the president of the group and the vice president and all those other jobs in January of 64. I had an anonymous phone call, and you guys just have to believe me, I never ever found out who that person was. He was a man probably in his 30s. He sounded like he really knew what he was talking about, he told me tomorrow at uh, a certain gate, the Beatles, John Lennon and George Harrison, will be aboard a plane. If you're smart, you'll get a tape recorder and record him. And that was the end of the conversation. I tried to get to engage him to tell me who he was. He said, no, I want to keep my job. That was the end of that story. Well, the next morning, they were supposed to arrive or be at the gate at 10 a.m. And I had a, we all had tape recorders with us. They were bulky and uh, expensive. But I grabbed mine and went to LAX. And in those days, guys, there was no restrictions on getting aboard a plane. I went to the desk and I said, I believe George and John Lennon and the girl stopped me. She said, yeah, they're all right down there. Just go down the ramp. They're in first class. I said, great. So I took my tape recorder, went aboard the plane, and there they were. There was John Lennon with his wife, Cindy. There was um, George Harrison with Patty Boyd. And I started recording and asking them questions that I think were really stupid at the time. I mean, they were dumb questions being asked by a dumb guy who didn't know that much about them. But it was the first time that anyone on the West Coast, really, really west of the Mississippi, had had the voices of any of the Beatles on tape. And that was a sensational moment in my career out here in L.A. What was the what was the craziest moment, the craziest radio moment that you can remember as far as the the Beatles go? Well, that would have to be when I was invited with Derek Taylor and myself, the Beatles road manager and myself, to go with the Beatles during the during the filming of Help, the motion picture Help, and and what they were they, we had a, a suite of rooms. They were adjoining in kind of a triplicate. Um, the Beatles had one room, and it, it adjoined on one side to uh, Brian Epstein, and uh, Derek Taylor and myself had a room that was adjoining the Beatles on the other side. And um, so when, when I got there, I had this whole thing planned. They were paying for everything. I didn't have to pay for anything. I'm this stoop from L.A., so I laid out a blanket on the sand where they were painting up Ringo 
with his big ring on his finger at the time and help when there were people trying to rip his finger apart to get this ring. Maybe you guys remember that more than oh, us. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, I set my blanket out and had my tape recorder out, and the first guy I was going to interview was George Harrison because John and Paul, were they had things to do down in the sand and all that with all of these people with guns and spears, but George had nothing to do. So he decided he'd walk around the island, Paradise Island, and uh, he found a dog. And he and the dog just walked around the island, and when he came back, I told him, George, I'm ready for you so we can uh, record for L.A. And he took and put his stuff down, and I had taken my sunglasses off. Now, in 1965... Um, it's sar- sunglasses were expensive at 60 to 80 bucks. I mean, people would laugh at that now. But that was like 800 bucks for a pair of sunglasses now. And George Harris saw the sunglasses and he said, that's where I left my glasses. And I said to him, no, George, those are mine. I just put them down there. And George Harrison said, no, they're not. They're mine. In other words, George had this look, you want this interview? <laughs> I, I didn't say a word. I just said, here, take the glasses. Well, Joanne Human, who was with um, Apple Records later, heard the interview and saw him uh, reciting the interview that we did. And um, she did the introduction to help uh, the making of the movie, re-release of the movie Help, and she wrote a piece, and I told her what happened. She had heard the interview with George, and she let me know by phone from London. I can tell you right now, after listening to what he said and what you said, those were not his glasses, and I said, thank you, Joab, because I've known for years they weren't either. I lost an $80 pair of gla- dollar pair of glasses to George Harrison. But I got back at the Beatles. I mean, George Harrison may have stolen my 60 or $80 dark glasses, but I got back at them all because my spy, with all of their information of their girlfriends, their phone numbers, their ad- private addresses, were given to me by Louise Harrison, George Harrison's mother. And I used to call her at, oh, 10 o'clock their time in Liverpool, And uh, George Harrison Sr. would answer the phone. And he had a deep British, hello, how are you? And I'd say, yes, uh, Mr. Harrison. And before I'd tell him who I was, oh, you're that silly fellow from from uh, the United States, America. And I'd say, yes, I am. And before I could say anything else, he'd hand the phone to Louise. (laughs) <laughs> well, Louise Harrison was a great person, a wonderful woman, and loved her boys. She used to call the Beatles her boys, and she wanted me to have information about George and all of the Beatles before anybody else got it. And she supplied me with their private phone numbers, their private addresses, and then I'd give them out on the air, and the Beatles' management would go nuts because they'd have to change the numbers. (laughs) The only thing is, I'd get the new numbers from Louise Harrison, or I'd start off the whole thing again. Did they have any, I mean, did, did, did they ever try and, I mean, you said the management would have to change the phone numbers. Did anybody ever try and track down who was providing the information? Well, they would ask me, Capitol Records, later on, Mm -hmm. ask me, Dave, you've got to tell us who your spy is because KHJ wants to know, because they were getting really upset because we were kicking their fanny and kicking KFWB's fanny out here in Hollywood, and they want to know. Well, Capitol Records didn't want to do anything to upset KHJ or KFWB. (laughs) And so they said to me, can you please tell us? And I said, no, I'm never going to tell you who it is. And um, they, oh, they get anxious with me and and didn't like those responses but for me um it was so obvious i was giving them information 
that George should have realized was coming from his mother, but he never did. And she was such a wonderful woman. She kept it up until I, I think, her death. And uh, I had their numbers and their information through 67, 8, and 9. Wow. You, you got, that's not the only time you got in trouble for something like that, because you got in trouble for playing Sgt. Pepper before it came out, correct? Well, yes, that's true. I, I went on the air, Capitol Records, there was a guy at Capitol Records, who used to say um, he'd send me stuff or come by the station and drop it off. And he would say to me, nobody has this. This is their newest recording. So they came with Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever. Maybe you guys will recall that song. (laughs) And one night I played it on the air, and KHJ went nuts. By then... KFWB, we'd force them to go to all news. So they were no longer in the music business as a radio station. But KHJ was going nuts because I put the record on one side, Penny Lane played the whole thing, and they didn't even know it existed. And then I flipped I flipped it over and played Strawberry Fields Forever and had people call in and tell us which song they liked the better. Well, I mean, we blew out. We literally blew out the phone lines at AT AT&T. Pasadena's entire phone system went down. And um, I'm not proud of that, but I I liked it. But I wasn't proud of that because that upset a lot of people in that large city of Pasadena, California. Nobody could make their phone calls. But during the balloting for that, Penny Lane came out on top by, I would say, five or six to one. And I simply, like John Lennon's, I thought Strawberry Fields Forever would become the bigger of the two hits. Well, I was wrong. The kids were right. And that's how that happened. Well, KHJ brought in um, their legal team. RKO General has a huge legal team and they went to capitol records and they threatened to sue us and capitol and everything well they rushed out a copy to khj of of strawberry fields and and uh, penny lane and my little tactic cost me dearly because i had to go into the general manager john barrett and explain to him what happened and i did not tell my boss who it was gave me that recording from Capitol Records. He said, I'll lose my job if anybody finds out. So I didn't even tell my boss who it was. Mm -hmm. So I was taken off the air for a period, I think, of, but I think it was two weeks. They took me off the air and suspended me from being on the air and for not telling them the truth about who it was that gave me that record. And, um, by then, KHJ had a copy of it anyway, and and the lawsuit never did go to fruition. But uh, it, it was an exciting time because they did finally, after a couple of weeks, reinstate me, and I went back on the air. Hmm. Ken? Now, how did it work that you were always able to get Beatle records first before the other stations like KHJ? Because I would imagine in every single market in the country... Every major station, every top 40 station, any station that would play the Beatles wanted to be the first ones to play their records. So there had to have been a war between the competing stations in most of the markets on that. And how was it that that your station always got the Beatle records first? Well, that's the fellow whose name I have never told anyone. I promised him I never would then. I promised him in the book Hullabaloo I would never reveal who he was. But it was that man at Capitol Records who worked in the printing. You know, he sat there and printed the records. I don't know if he was in the labeling department. I don't know. But that man I promised I would never tell. But that man really got me the material before anyone else had it across the country, and especially in L.A. That's amazing. 
All right. Can we talk about um, the Hollywood Bowl concerts? Because um, it does say in your book that you and also the newsman at the time at KRLA, uh, you both interviewed the Beatles, and those interviews actually wound up being on the VJ album, Hear the Beatles Tell All. Yes, the Beatles Tell All, which was Jim Steck, right. who went on to be the news director in San Francisco after he left KRLA. He's deceased now. He was a wonderful man. who He and I had access to the Beatles' home in, in Hollywood, and we took the tape recorder and went in, and he did John Lennon. He just wanted John Lennon. I wanted all of, of the four other guys, the three other guys. I had a little bit of John, but Jim Steck wanted him exclusively. And that's what turned out to be, Hear the Beatles Tell All. Now, the thing about that album was that they had my name with John Lennon and Jim Steck's name on the side that I recorded with all of the others. Oh, my. Yeah, and that turned out to be, uh, well, somebody offered me $25,000, guys. This is 50, 40 years ago, offered me $25,000 for a copy of the mislabeled Hear the Beatles Tell All, and I sold it to him. I, I'm a mercenary guy. I have to feed my family, too. Wow. Wow. Did you like the uh, uh, th that in when they put out the interview, they overdubbed uh, music on top of it. Did you like that? Uh, well, we had very little to do with it. Uh, they used a drummer. Mm -hmm. I I can't remember now. A very popular, uh, strong rhythm drummer, and they used him throughout in the background of the interview. I think they wanted something to keep the music end of it alive with somebody who's buying an album with just straight interviews. I suppose uh, Blaine was his name. Hal Blaine. Blaine. Oh, yes. Hal Blaine from the Wrecking Crew. Wow. Yes, yes. I think it was Hal Blaine that did the background of playing the drums, and he was excellent. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't seem to hamper it. It turned out to be a multi-million seller, you know, two guys talking with four people. Let's talk a little bit more about the Hollywood Bowl. Is that you? Um, are you one of the voices with uh, that go, uh, here they are, the Beatles, at the beginning yes. of uh, the 64 recording? Yes, I am. And um, there was a great story about that that nobody has heard, uh, I don't think. Uh, Dick Biondi was standing on stage when I was out there talking to the crowd. And I was tooting that horn of mine, and it went out on me. I mean, the bulb just wouldn't work. And I was so frustrated that I stayed there m longer than I should, I suppose, trying to get that horn to work and trying to keep myself talking until it did. Well, Paul McCartney uh, bumped into Dick Biondi, who was backstage, and he says, that man goes on a bit, doesn't he? <laughs> and, and Dick Biondi turned around, and it was Paul McCartney. And Dick said to him, yeah, he does that a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a story that I don't think, it didn't make the book, but uh, Dick uh, told me about that story and how he uses it in Chicago, and it always gets a laugh or two. As far as the performance is concerned on stage at the Hollywood Bowl, it has to be the most electrifying concert in the history of the Bowl and L.A., it really must. Oh, there have probably been bigger concerts now with more people. But there were ten or 15,000 people just sitting on the hill behind the Hollywood Bowl audience who paid money for their tickets. And it was an, it, for those days, it was something that you had to be there to see, to believe. Have you heard any, any uh, rumblings from Capitol about releasing it on CD? Um, th there's been rumors like that for some time. Have you guys heard anything? Not no, like, no, I mean not more than not more than probably you have. I mean, it's been bootleg. You know, they were bootlegged. In fact, they're all th all uh, three recordings were put out 
um, you know, a bootleg set several years ago. And then, you know, of course, they put out the vinyl album, um, but they haven't. There has been no announcement of a CD. We keep hoping. I haven't heard any more about it either. I would like to tell you one thing about Bill Hayes and Jennifer Thomas. They're the people who came to me to write the book Hullabaloo, The Life and Misadventures of Dave Hull. And um, my daughter and my wife had been after me for years. You've got to write a book. And I said, I don't have enough to write about. I mean, my life is just, it's, it's totally unlike what I had on the air, my persona. And I had kids. I went to their little league games and their high school football games and so forth, all of my boys. And my daughter was a cheerleader eventually for the Los Angeles Rams. We went to her games. And so I was a totally different person than my persona on the air with this craziness stuff that I did. I had a wonderful time on the air, and and uh, uh, Bill Hayes and Jennifer Thomas knew that. They used to listen to me while they were kids growing up. And uh, they came to me and asked me, did I want to write a book? And after my wife and daughter had been on me for years, I said yes. And I'd like to have some of the compliments given to them because they were quite helpful. If you like the book and... Uh, I think it was Ken who said he enjoyed it, or maybe it was you, Steve. But that they took the things, the stories I wrote, and put them into a, a, a bound leather novel, an autobiographical novel that is over 600 pages long, and they did a marvelous job with it. And I think somebody ought to pay them the kind of uh, gratitude and respect that both Bill Hayes and Jennifer Thomas deserve. Hmm. Well, they both did a wonderful job. Yeah, yeah, they really they really did. They did a fantastic job. Yeah. I'd like to just ask you one more thing, because it's probably uh, a story in your life that you may be best known for where the Beatles are concerned, and that's how you and the newsman, Jim Steck, were actually stowaways on the plane that went from LAX Airport to Denver, when the Beatles were on their way to uh, Red Rocks, and how did all that happen? Yeah, I, because Jim was the instigator of that. Jim Steck was a newsman who was maniacal. <laughs> you think I was kind of cockeyed. Well, this guy was, but he was in, in the de news department. And so he said, I'm going aboard the plane, Dave. And I said to him, Jim, you're nuts. I mean, that's stowaway. That's a federal offense. They'll put you away. He said, I don't care what you say. And he took his tape recorder and ran up the stairs to the plane to board it. And I ran after him. And I want you guys to know the truth. I really was not going to steal aboard the plane. I ran up after Jim Steck to grab him, to grab him and, and forcefully try to hold him. And... Um, the people with, that were in the Beatles' entourage recognized Jim and me because we had <laughs> interviewed them at their Beverly Hills home that they had rented. So they thought we were running to get on the plane, so they just waved us in. Well, when we called our boss to tell him, John Barrett, that Jim had stolen aboard the plane and they put us both on it, he said, you better get... Uh, you better get um, the manager of the of the Beatles at the time, Brian Epstein. He said, you better get Brian Epstein to put you on the manifest or the federal government will lock you guys up forever. <laughs> and so we went to his uh, hotel room and introduced ourselves, and uh, Derek Taylor was then employed with them. And he said, I think you better do it or you're going to lose some valuable people in L.A. Mm -hmm. And so he did. He put us retroactively on the manifest. And I'll tell you something, if that hadn't happened, guys, I wouldn't be talking to you today. <laughs> uh, well, uh, fantastic story. Dave, where's the book's available on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, and in, in uh, book-and-mortar stores, correct? 
Yes, it is, and you can also, if if people want to go get it, they can go to www.davehullabalooer.com, and at our website, it'll tell you how to order, how to make uh, your payment, and it'll also give you some other things that are pertinent to the Beatles that you won't get anywhere else. Thank you very much for asking, because that is a is really a, a lovable website that a lot of people do not know about, but it's more than just the book. It's a lot of other information that I and and uh, Bill and Jennifer provide to the website. So thank you for mentioning that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Before you close this off, Ken and Steve, I thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you. It, it doesn't happen very often to be with guys who are so nice and have been wonderfully supportive to me. I thank you so much for letting me, giving me the opportunity to be with you today. Well, it was, it was really, it was our pleasure. It was really our pleasure, Dave. It's, um, it's not only a pleasure, it's an honor to be part of someone who was, who was a part of the history, not just of the Beatles, but in radio, in the whole history of radio. Right. And for people I, who, who appreciate what it was like at that time and along with the other legends that you work with, for whom we're all grateful for. Right. We didn't even talk about the monkeys and the stones and anybody, anything like that. Do you want to you just give a quick story about, about uh, maybe one other group, uh, Dave? Well, the Dave Clark Five, I was interviewed by Pat Sajak during the time the Beatles were big. And he had me on his television show. This is before he ever did the Wheel of Whatever. Wheel of and Fortune. All of the things, yeah, Wheel of Fortune or whatever. Pat Sajak was a personality on television, and he had me on the air. And I want to tell you one of the funniest things that ever were said to me on a television show was by Pat Sajak. He looked at me and he said, Dave, you're the Beatles president and vice president of their of their national fan club. But I want you to know I was the Dave Clark six of the <laughs> Dave Clark five. Yeah. I was the Dave Clark you may have been the fifth Beatle. You may have been the fifth Beatle, but I was the sixth Dave Clark five. And I tell you he brought the house down when he said it. Really a nice guy and, and that's a great way to end this. Uh, the they and the Stones, I would say the Rolling Stones, were a big part of my career, too, and for Bob Eubanks. And in closing, I'll just tell you that they had picked up uh, Levi Strauss Levi in, in uh, pants for the whole group of the, uh, the um, Stones in New York, and they had to stay in them for their whole tour. When they got to the Long Beach uh, Arena, to put on their show, I was back in the back with them, along with Rona Barrett and several other people, and uh, they took off their pants to give themselves a sponge bath, and they had, their legs were blue. They had been in these Levi's for so many days, working on stage without any baths or bathing time, that it was unbelievable. That is something that I don't know was in the book or not, but that, too, is a true story. Thank you, guys, giving me thus much time. To oh, you're that. welcome. You're welcome, Dave. That was a pleasant memory to close with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. Well, anyway, it's Dave, again, on behalf of Ken and myself, thank you very much for, for being on the show with us. Um, I mean, it, it, it was great talking to you. And and that's it for this week. Um, thanks to uh, Fab4Radio.com, where you can hear the show every weekend uh, at noon Saturday, ET Saturday, and noon and midnight ET Sunday. And that's where you'll be able to hear this show first. You can catch my Beatles Examiner column and columns for the other Beatles and Vintage Rock and Roll on Examiner.com. And I have my uh, I have a, a small ebook, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, on Amazon.com and Barnes and Noble. Ken. Okay, we like our theme so much, we're going to play it for you again right here. <laughs> That's right. And Are you going to say something, though? Yeah, I just want to say this is Ken Michaels thanking Dave Hull so much for joining us. We hope to have you on again. Anytime you want to join us, feel free. His new book, again, is called Hullabaloo. I want to thank everybody for listening, and I'll see you next time. See you next time.